I want to talk about something which I claim happened before the Big Bang. In the first millionth of a millionth of a second, the universe expanded very, very quickly. That something is very strange with our universe at the largest scales. What else is there to be explained other than what the universe is doing, right? As George mentioned, in the 1920s, uh, Hubble, Mr. Hubble the man, uh, discovered that uh, the universe was expanding. It was a big surprise. Um, in the late 1990s, Hubble the spaceship uh, discovered that this expansion of the universe was speeding up. Um, this was an enormous surprise. I think it, there were you know, maybe a handful of people on the planet who somehow had suspected this for one reason or another. But for most people in, in cosmology, in, in physics, this sort of blew them out of the water, and there, were, there was no reason at all that they could think of about why this was, was, was happening. Um, since that time, the evidence for this um, has really become overwhelming. Um, we have three, um, I think we'll talk about this a little later, three very direct ways of, of looking at the universe and seeing that, that it's, it's true, the, the, un, the expansion of the universe is, is speeding up. Um, our best theory for this uh, comes from Einstein. And the best theory is that 70% of the energy of the universe is this anti-gravity force field spread thinly throughout space and making everything repel. Okay, it sounds like something from, from science fiction, but we have this great theory that Einstein gave us and it, it matches the observations that we see. Um, I should say that it, it wasn't always like this uh, throughout the history of the universe. So, so there's something a bit weird that happens as the universe expands, uh, the galaxies in the universe obviously get further and further apart, and so they get more dilute. But this dark energy, this smeared everywhere, that doesn't get more dilute as the universe expands. It has this very weird property that it stays exactly constant amount in density as the universe expands, which means that um, if you go way, way back to the Big Bang, if you go back 14 billion years ago, the amount of dark energy in the universe was just negligible. It wasn't playing any role at all. Then the universe expands and the galaxies get further and further away. And it's only around the 10 billion year mark that this dark energy appears to take over. So that's weird. Somehow there's, there's this uh, property of the universe that does nothing at all for 10 billion years and then takes over the entire universe. Okay? That's part of the problem about why we're struggling to understand this, why we're struggling to write down a theory, a natural theory of dark energy that, that you know, is lethargic for 10 billion years, and then, then something gets all excited and pushes the universe apart. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd, I'd like to touch upon uh, in later discussions is exactly what George was saying about the discrepancy with, with quantum theory. So there's, there's a story which, which could just be one of the most wonderful stories in, in, in physics. Um, the story is that uh, if you look um, at very, very small scales in physics, we have quantum mechanics, uh, which is the right theory, and quantum mechanics tells us that the vacuum of space is a really interesting place. If you go to space and you take everything out of it, um, because of basically what's called the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, you can't have zero energy. Instead, space is kind of this bubbling soup of quantum fluctuations, particles which pop out of space and go back again. And again, this, this is not science fiction. This is something that we can test. This is something that we've, we've seen in laboratories and we can measure and, and we know it's there. And a very natural question is, is what effect does this have on the universe, this bubbling quantum soup? Um, and it turns out, wonderfully, the effect this has is that it's dark energy. This bubbling quantum soup makes the entire universe want to expand and speed up. This, if it could work, would be amazing. Right? This is a theory on the very, very smallest scales telling us what the universe is doing on the very biggest scales. This would be one of the great successes of science. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Um, when you do the calculation, you find that the amount of dark energy due to the bubbling soup is a little bit too big <laughs> to explain what we see. It's too big um, by about a factor of 10 to the 60. That, that's a million, 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 I'd say a million 10 times. Right? It, it's literally the worst prediction in the history of science. Um, and I don't know why it's wrong. So from my perspective, this is why dark energy is so exciting, that, that we know this quantum stuff is there, and we know gravity is there, and yet for some reason, um, the two just aren't fitting together. I think of all the hints in physics, this, this is uh, 
probably the most crucial. This is telling us that there's something really deep and important that we don't understand about the universe. And for me, that's why this is so exciting. It may be that the Big Bang was the beginning. Uh, as Roger has emphasized for many years now, the observed fact is that our early universe is very, very special. If you took all the different ways you could arrange all the photons and particles of matter in the universe, the one that we actually have for the, our observed Big Bang is extraordinarily unlikely. That's these 10 to the 10 to the 120 something uh, <laughs> unlikely. And so, Either that was a tremendous accident and we got lucky, nobody believes that, or there's a reason why. That's something that does uh, d seem to demand a reason why. Maybe it's because it was the best, it was the simplest, right? Um, Roger has the idea of the cycles and the eons is, is another one. Um, so let me, let me actually try to defend this idea of inflation that has been remarked upon a couple times. Inflation seems like a cheat vis-a-vis -vis this particular problem, because the problem is, why is the universe so unlikely? Inflation is a theory where you start in a particular kind of state, and then it expands and cools, and very naturally becomes the universe that we see. But that place you started, as Laura already said, is even more unlikely. So that doesn't seem to help. The reason why it might help is because even though it's unlikely in this sort of sense of all the possible ways the universe could start, it is maybe makeable in a way that the ordinary universe is not. If you see the universe that is all around us with uh, two trillion galaxies in the observable universe, and you wind that clock backwards until you hit the point at which quantum gravity is unavoidable, right? The, the closest thing we can come to the beginning of the universe, and you don't believe in inflation, everything we see around us was this big. It was about one centimeter across. You might think, if you're not a highly trained professional cosmologist, that's very small. Yeah. <laughs> but if you are a highly trained professional cosmologist, you're like, that's huge. Because you're comparing it to subatomic scales, the size of atoms and particles. So you needed a universe that was perfectly smooth and regular across a centimeter, when all the particles that we know about are much, much, much smaller than that. What inflation lets you do is start the universe much, much, much smaller than that. So if you have a theory for how universes are created, such as my favorite theory of baby universes, where you start with a big empty universe and there's a quantum fluctuation that bubbles off, a little bubble of space that grows into our universe, the little bubble of space that you make is much more likely to be small than to be big. And if you want to start with a small universe and make a big one like ours, inflation does a very good job. <laughs> So I think that there can be a role for inflation. Whether or not it's true, I'm not sure. 10%, right? But nevertheless, it does serve a, an obvious purpose that we might like to take advantage of in understanding why we started from someplace very special and got the universe we see. Um, our standard model of cosmology says that the universe started with some particle known as the inflaton field that was at very high energies and, and uh, that, the energy of that particle propelled that initial small universe into an accelerated expansion. And, and uh, in other words, the universe went through a big bang phase and, and it grew quite large, quite fast. The, the observational test of, of that theory, known as inflation, uh, one of the observational tests is the microwave background. If that story is correct, what we expect to see in the sky today, all, all those photons lurking around, and, and all the structure distributed in the universe, since all of those effects, including um, structure formation, originate from that, from fluctuations of that initial inflaton field, then what we expect to see today is a very homogeneous and, and uniform distribution of whether it's structure or the microwave background. What Planck found is that indeed at short scales, now I'm talking in uh, terms of cosmological scales, so by short I mean 100 megaparsec or 200 megaparsec, the size of a galaxy. So in, in those scales, uh, indeed Planck and WMAP previously found an exquisite agreement of what our standard model of cosmology says and what they observed. Now let, let me um, make a caveat here. Whenever we are looking at a 
over dense region in the sky. For example, a star, a galaxy, or, or a collection of, of such objects, massive objects. That will show up in a temperature map. That will show up as a hot spot. Wherever you have a concentration of mass, that region is hot. If, if there is emptiness, like the space between galaxies, that will show up as, as a cold area in, in the temperature map of the sky. And, and that's what Planck was, was uh, taking a snapshot of, this hot and cold spots, the distribution of the hot and cold spots. What they discovered is that at these short and intermediate scales, indeed everything looks uniformly and homogeneously distributed, as, as we expect it and as it should be. And, and that's a major success of our standard model of cosmology. What they discovered, which, which makes their findings incredibly interesting, is that this story changes drastically at the largest possible scales. If we are looking at scales of, say, the size of the universe, known as the horizon scale, or, or even shorter scales, but something a distance comparable to, to the size of the universe, then the uh, homogeneity and the uniformity of the microwave background sky seems to be broken. And, and that was one of the most important findings of the century. It was a spectacular discovery. It, it had been previously, of course, uh, seen by uh, the WMAP, the previous satellite experiment, and even COBE over uh, two decades ago. However, uh, first of all, our statistics and technology were not good enough for us to um, be able to, to tell that what we are looking at is not an anomaly, that comes from nature, but it, it's a statistical fluke or, or a problem with the instrumentation. Planck was quite advanced and sophisticated in, in terms of uh, those problems, te uh, technology problems and statistical problems. They, they had a lot more data so they could carry out better analysis and therefore they confirmed whatever they found. Nobody could question or doubt that that effect, that anomaly observed at the larger scales might be due to something else, like a statistical fluke. And, and that's why the, the discoveries that Planck made on, at those scales are extremely important. So here's the idea. The idea is that everything in the universe, including stuff that's now a very long way away, at the beginning of the universe, it started off very close to us. And because the universe at that point was very small, it's possible that all the different parts of the universe behaved in the same way, and that could be why the universe, even on the very largest scales today, is essentially the same as it is here. Now, as this expansion took place, uh, imagine that you thinking of the universe as a sort of crumpled up kid's balloon. And as you blow it up, it starts off very curved, but eventually it becomes, locally at least, almost flat. And that is what we see today, the universe today on the very large scales, does look almost flat. The final detail is quantum fluctuations. So we think that this energy could have been in some sort of field, maybe the Higgs field, as I said. And those quantum fluctuations in the Higgs field could be the origin of the inhomogeneities that we see in the universe today. So uh, here I have again one of my uh, little uh, animations. Sorry, it went very quickly. Here it is again. Okay. So quantum fluctuations in the early universe. Then when the universe finally comes out of this inflationary phase, those fluctuations are translated into variations in the density of stuff in the universe, and in particular, fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. So that's the theory. Just to remind you, this energy here would have been infamous dark energy that we keep on talking about. So this theory works very well for describing the origin of all the structures in the universe. Um, so now I am running over time. <laughs> so anyway, this is the way it works. So here I have my quantum fluctuation of a uh, universe. Then at the end of inflation, this translates into fluctuations in the density of stuff in the universe. And in particular, if I drop some dark matter into the universe, then gravity causes that dark matter to cluster, and that forms clusters of galaxies, 
galaxies, stars, planets, and Optron. I mean, physicists tell you how accurately we can measure how the expansion of the universe is increasing. Well, I have two problems with that. Firstly, um, the galaxies that we see at the very edge of the universe, um, we're looking so far back in time. This is back before the era where dark energy kicked in, and I don't understand how this means that they can be affecting it. And secondly, what do we need to know? We need to know their... Uh, their velocities and their distances. Distances we measure using redshift. We assume that the Hubble constant is really a constant and that the, it works exactly the same for distant galaxies as for things nearby. Distance is far more problematic. I can measure the distance to the nearest stars, or well, astronomers can, by using the parallax of the Earth's orbit. That's simple geometry. We can do that accurately. To go beyond that, requires a lot of theoretical input, that certain kinds of stars always behave in the same way, and we can use them as standard candles to go on, and then that certain kinds of galaxies behave in the same way, and we can use them as standard candles. Yet, everything I read in astronomy says stars are far more variable, and galaxies are far more variable than we had any right to expect. There must be huge error bars with these estimates. So when you tell me that we can measure accurately the increase in expansion of the universe at these large scales. I just simply do not believe it. Now the next question is, what's all this at the beginning? I've, there's the thing called inflation. Now if you look at any modern cosmology book, whether it's popular or whether it's technical, they talk about within the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds, that means one over the fraction of a second, that is, which is something 32 digits long. Ridiculously tiny fraction of a second. The universe was supposed to have inflated. Now, to get you some picture of what inflation looks like, I'm putting a powerful magnifying glass here to have a good look. And what do we see? I should point out that we don't see that. That's the handle of the magnifying glass. <laughs> but uh, what you see is something very similar Let's back up to what you see in the remote future. So it's, it's sort of a model of what's happening there, but tucked in at the beginning. Now you see, uh, uh, the reason I was not uh, keen on mentioning it here, there's two reasons. One is, of course, it might be there, tucked in, and that's why we need the magnifying glass. The other reason is I don't really believe it. So this is putting me in a bad minority, but I'm already in a minority, so that doesn't matter too much. So I'm trying to say I don't believe in this. But there are good reasons to believe in it. Let me say what the bad reason is first. One of the reasons people put forward is that you want to explain the curious fact that the universe is really very, very uniform. And this was one of the explanations that somehow, if it was very irregular, then this inflationary phase would stretch it all out flat. Now, I never believed that argument. And the sort of reason is the following. Imagine that the universe was collapsing, so time is now still going up, but then there will all be sorts of wrinkles, there will be black holes, and this picture now is not... I wanted to use another picture, but I couldn't find it, so we'll don't, you have to imagine it. A very, very complicated thing up there, which doesn't look like that like, clean little point, but a great mess up there. That's the sort of thing you get when black holes... You see, this four black holes will form, and they'll congeal and make a huge mess, and it would look horrible, not like that nice point. So. Why wasn't it like that the other way around? You see, the equations of Einstein work just as well in time one way or as the other way. So why was it not that huge mess at the beginning? And inflation doesn't solve that equation. That doesn't solve that problem. But I want to talk about that because this is a key point of the argument. And for the moment, I'm not going to say why. I'm just going to say what, in a certain sense. And to do that, it's useful to go back to the Escher picture, which I just showed you, and we, now this is a spatial picture, not time in it, so it's just space, but these angels and devils inhabit this infinite universe. So although it looks to us as they're getting smaller and smaller to, uh, to the edge, you have to imagine, well, you can choose the angel or the devil, whichever you prefer, that you are the same size, no matter how close to the edge you are. So these fellows 
or fellow S's, no matter where you are, you will see um, it looks just like the beginning. And the transformation involved here is what's called conformal. That is, you squash down in all directions by the same amount. So you're not just squashing this way, but you're squashing that by, by the same amount. And it's a very nice kind of geometry. Angles, like the angle on the wing of this uh, devil, will be the same, no matter how close to the edge you are. The eyes will be the same shape, no how close to the edge they are. They're just a different size. So it's a, it's a kind of geometry, a very beautiful kind of geometry, where you're not interested in distances, but you're interested in, in shapes, small shapes, or if you like, angles. And this is a very crucial part to the argument that I want to give here. So these angels and devils, for their, from their point of view, the universe is completely infinite. We look at it from a different perspective. We allow ourselves to squash the infinity down in this conformal way. And you could imagine stepping from here out to there. You, they can't do it. But you can sort of imagine something might do that. So let's come to that. Um, OK, now I've now applied this to the universe. This was the picture, drawn smaller now, of the history of the universe. Keeps on going out to infinity. But that infinity, like in the angels and devils picture, is squashed down to this boundary here. So that represents the infinity of this universe. And that's quite accepted thing you can do. Um, the universe, as far as we understand it, in the very remote future will smooth itself out in a way which allows us to... They're very general theorems, a theorem due to a, a German, Helmut Friedrich, who established under very general circumstances this conformal squashing down can be done. So there's no argument there. What I'm doing here on the beginning is the opposite thing. I'm stretching out the Big Bang to make it look like a nice smooth surface. Now that is not something which generally happens. It only happens when the universe starts out very, very regular and smooth in the way we seem to see it. And there's a thing I used to call the vile curvature hypothesis. Not bothered to explain what that means because it's a bit technical. Uh, and my former student and colleague, uh, Paul Todd, who had another way of saying it. What is it? It says that the beginning of the universe is conformally nice and smooth, so you can do this. That's a hypothesis. If you adopt that hypothesis, then you do get this universe which is sort of smooth in the way we see. And it's in very important for this thing called the second law of thermodynamics. The uh, second law of thermodynamics says that this thing called entropy, which increases as you go, as time increases, and the uh, thing is that we see in the universe observationally <coughs> But it looks as though the entropy is very, very high at the beginning, which should be very low because it has to start low. How is it low? It's low in gravity, which means that the universe is made. I don't really want to go into that argument. I shouldn't even start it, it? Because, it's, <laughs> because it's key to the description, but it will distract me too much for what I want to say. I just say there's good reason for saying that this can be stretched out. It's very nice. It solves a lot of problems if that is the way the universe, for some reason, stretches out like that. What's the reason? Well, here's what I'm saying the reason is. is because this uh, universe, as we think of it, starting from the Big Bang, ending up with this eternal exponential expansion going on and on and on, getting you more and more boring as, as time goes on. And the argument is that that, our universe, as we, so, as we thought, is not the whole story that this future, remember the Escher picture, can be stretched, squashed down, and now it becomes the Big Bang of the next eon. And so this is what I call conformal cyclic cosmology, that we are here, there was one of these eons, I'm calling them an eon, I looked up in the dictionary to make sure an eon, A-E-O-N, was not an actual length of time, it seems to be a rather, it's a long time, but not a definite length of time, which is fine by me. So I use that term here, a cosmic eon is that. But I'm claiming there was a cosmic eon preceding us, one later than us, one preceding before, and so on. And they just continue indefinitely.